Our theme in these weeks before and including Easter is our friend, the Lord. And how incredible it is that in one Sunday morning we can gather and talk about our friend in grief and find that during the course of the week, one who has been a part of us has already walked into the presence of the Lord and uh, has seen him as that friend forever. I'm continually struck with the veil, how thin it is, that separates us from being known of him completely and fully. I would like today to have you see with me another dimension to the friendship of our Lord, and that is his friendship towards sinners. The gospel text is St. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not on account of the crowd, because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for Jesus was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The setting for the story is that Jesus is passing through Jericho. As you follow the gospel narrative, you soon discover that his next stop is Jerusalem. It will be the week of his passion in Jerusalem. So that this is his last time in Jericho. It is the last days of his earthly life. On the way into Jericho, as seen in the previous chapter, Luke 18, he has seen and heard the blind man who is named in Mark as Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is cried out, and the Lord made himself known to Bartimaeus and granted him sight. On the way out of town, he finds another man, this time not a man who is blind physically, but a man who is blind spiritually, who is rich and powerful, but who is unloved and unwanted by those who know him. Jesus, on the way into the town and on the way out of the town, demonstrates his concern for these individuals. And it indeed is a tremendous thing to note about our Lord that in those moments of his ministry when we would allow him, if he wanted to be, to be preoccupied with other thoughts, the thoughts about his approaching death and the suffering of crucifixion, the thoughts about how he would lay down his life for the whole world, even for us, we would grant that if he wanted to be preoccupied with those greater issues during this time, He should have had that privilege. But never is he so preoccupied with himself that he cannot notice the individual, the one who stands out even in the crowd, who needs him, and therefore he puts aside and lays aside all of the other concerns that are upon him and takes time to enjoy a dinner, a feast, and a stay at the home of a man who had been the outcast in his society. Incredible as it is, the Lord on the way to his death takes a moment to have merriment and to be received joyfully by a person who will be his host. And uh, as you look at the Lord, by the way, in these last days of his ministry, typical of his earthly ministry through the three years, he continues doing the unexpected. You would think that in the last days of his ministry, he would be more than ever taking his campaign, his message, his doctrine to the multitudes. But he is only walking among the multitudes. When you find him teaching When you find him talking, by and large, it is to the individual 
It is to the small company of disciples. It is as if the Lord in those last moments reaches out for the quality of human fellowship rather than the quantity of speaking to a crowd which does not necessarily bring with it the relationship to an individual person. Here, on the way outside of Jericho, this town, 15 miles to the northeast of Jerusalem, Jesus takes time to meet a man by the name of Zacchaeus. I would like for us today to see this person, Zacchaeus, in three ways. To see him, first of all, as others saw him. Secondly, to see him, perhaps, as he saw himself. And then thirdly, to see him as the Lord saw him. And in looking at Zacchaeus that way, it would be helpful for us to look at ourselves, for the Gospels were written for us. And there are ways that people see us. There are ways we see ourselves. But we must never forget, as we are sometimes tempted to do, how the Lord really sees us. First of all, Zacchaeus is seen by others. A paradox is seen immediately. Others see him as a success and a sinner. At one and the same time, he is both. A man of wealth, but a man to be despised. We see him in terms of his success by the identification that he is a chief tax collector and he was rich. That denotes his success. It is the only time in the Gospels that the word chief is used in reference to the administrative position tax collector. Some six times in all in the Gospel of Luke, he notes how Jesus had concourse with tax collectors. This is the only one who was chief, indicating he had the major and the key administrative responsibility for the collection of taxes within the area which was around the city of Jericho. William Barclay in his daily study Bible notes for us the practice of tax collection as it existed in first century Palestine and under the Roman administration. And I want to review it briefly for a moment for it says something to us about the stature of this person whom Jesus is going to be meeting with. The Romans had the practice of exercising two kinds of taxes upon the people and their tax administration was farmed out, its responsibility was farmed out to the person who bid highest for the post. There were certain kinds of taxes which were called stated taxes. These were due and there was not a give and take on the taxes. They were just straight out. You had to pay them no more, no less. The stated taxes were these. A poll tax, which was simply a tax for the privilege of existing, which all men between the ages of 14 to 65 had to pay annually, and all women between the ages of 12 and 65. I don't know there who it was that was carrying forth the cause of women's taxation in those years, but there it is. Taxed a little bit more than the men. There was another tax which was stated. It was called the ground tax. And it was a tax which was levied upon one-tenth of all grain was Caesar's and one-fifth of all oil and wine. If you were a farmer, how would you like to tithe on top of that? Income tax was a third stated tax, and that is 1% of each person's income was required. There was, however, a second kind of tax, and this is the one where a tax collector, if he were a crafty person, could really get rich. For a certain assessment was made of the district in terms of what kinds of revenues it should produce in terms of taxation for Caesar. Once the assessment was made, then the tax collector was responsible for raising that amount. If he didn't, that was it. It was a very dangerous job. You could be immensely successful or you could be out of it real quick. If, however, the tax collector paid for the amount that was assessed, all monies he raised in taxes over that was his for his own personal use. And taxes that were called duty types of taxes included taxes for using main roads and harbors, markets, the sale of certain articles, just like we have federal excise tax, there would be excise tax on certain articles. There was an import-export tax, and since Jericho was in the center of a very fertile agricultural region, as well as at the drop-off for a crossroads trading into the east uh, in Jericho were groves of palm trees and it was the center for the balsam trade which went as resin for various ointments and processes used throughout the Mediterranean world. Zacchaeus was in a key place financially to be a tax collector and no doubt he had purchased his office at great price and on top of it he had maintained himself in his office and become very wealthy in the collection of his taxes. So 
So, here was a man of considerable success. Of course, the, along with that, tax collecting went the normal process in those days that tax collectors, if they confronted someone that couldn't pay up, could make them a loan at an exorbitant interest rate. And the person then would be responsible for paying the taxes in installments along with the exorbitant interest rate as well. doesn't sound much different from then as it does today, does it? Tax collectors were classed in the category with robbers and murderers, and with good reason in those days. And even if they were Jewish, they were barred from the synagogue, could take no part in Jewish social or religious life. In our culture, a, a person who was a tax collector could have had his pick of homes in our society in Big Canyon, Collins Isle, Spyglass Hill. He would have had his own yacht or several of them, a Cadillac and Lincoln and a Rolls Royce in the driveway and a, and a private airplane if he had wanted and all the accoutrements of, of financial success and stature. But strangely enough, while this man was a financial success, he also was regarded as a sinner. And not simply regarded as a sinner by the Lord, but regarded as a sinner by those who were his peers and who lived in his society and had a chance to see him at work. I must admit that one of my temptations every time I read the Gospels and find a person that Jesus ministered to, my tendency is to warm up to them and only see their good side. Oh, Zacchaeus must have been a wonderful person. That's why the Lord called him. Well, certainly the Lord saw that wonderfulness in him. But if you had related to him in a business transaction, you would not have thought him a wonderful person. You would have called him a scoundrel, or if you had lived in the first century, you would have called him, given your religious perspective, a sinner. And here's why he could be called a sinner. He acted contrary to his religious faith. His religious faith said, you shall not steal, and he stole. His religious faith taught him against usury, and yet he practiced usury. His religious faith had taught him concern for human need, but he had evidently no concern for human need. In fact, I would see this man as a person who in the pursuit of money and riches had demonstrated a remarkable non-sympathy for human need. To kind of flesh out this person and feel what he might have been like, let's suppose that your name was John Smith, son of Abraham, and you lived in a kind of a, a, a reasonable rent, a low rent, area and you and your wife with your two or three children were just barely eking out an existence kind of paying enough to keep food on the table macaroni and small portions of meat and other kinds of things in a day of inflation and and uh, you were driving a uh, last decade's car and and behind on your installments and just barely barely making it and along comes uh, Zacchaeus or an emissary of his and says We've just discovered that we haven't been taxing this household enough. And therefore, an added tax of 10% is hereby added for all the fixed assets which you have in this apartment or house. And you see what that would do to the family immediately? They'd have to make their food stretch further. They'd have to make their car last longer. The kids would have to go with less presents for Christmas. There'd be less family outings. All of these kinds of mean things Zacchaeus caused. He was a mean man. He was selfish. And on top of it, he was a collaborator with the Roman government. This would be equivalent in our society to having Communist China or Soviet Russia in charge of the United States and one of our own American citizens serving as the tax collector for the uh, communists. Do you think we would really enjoy paying taxes to a person like that who would turn the quizzling on us? So here he was, this mix of a man, as seen by others, marvelously financially successful, but sinner. Now, how did he see himself? Well, no doubt he saw himself in several ways. I pick up at least a couple in this story that are of interest. One way that he probably saw himself was, is given for us in the text of Luke. He saw himself as a person that was small of stature. When he looked in the mirror, he was short. And evidently he had this need within him, whether it was caused as a result of a psychological fix because of his physical condition, whatever, because he was a small man who wanted to be a big man. And he took uh, great pains and effort and ambition to bring that into eventuality. A man who will drive like this to be a chief 
financial administrator for an area has to have some ambition. He didn't get that job by hoping someday that the job would drop in his lap. He pushed other people out of the way. He financially climbed the ladder. He was known as being the guy that was in his office at six in the morning and left at nine at night, and he drove his employers until their fingernails were worn down to a frazzle. He made secretaries bite their pencils through. And this kind of a man was used to, to need, deep ego needs for success, for stature. And while we can see some negative things to that, it also certainly may indicate that being small of stature, he had perhaps found that a constant need in his life to have a creative approach to problems. That this is a hallmark of his administrative ability. You recall that when he's in the crowd and wants to see Jesus, he can't get through the crowd and everybody's too big. And by the way, it was quite a thing for him to even be in the crowd. Chief tax collector, there was more than one person that would like to put the knife right in his back when he wasn't looking. So there he was, risking his life in the crowd, wanting to see Jesus, and he sees which way Jesus is heading, and so he runs on ahead and climbs up in a tree. Very resourceful. He uh, was used to getting things done, even if he lost some dignity in doing them. <laughs> and certainly climbing a tree was not the most dignified thing that the chief tax administrator of an area could do. And here he is. In the midst of this crowd thronging around to see Jesus, you kind of have to get a pictorial fix on what it must have looked like. And he's uh, with the crowd, many of whom are earnest followers of Jesus, others who are simply inquirers, some sermon tasters, some miracle seekers, some disciples, but amidst them all, Zacchaeus is wanting to get through for a look himself. He must see Jesus. He saw himself as a man who was small of stature, with big ambitions, but still he had a great need in his life. That's how he saw himself. His name, Zacchaeus, is a tip-off as to what might have happened within him when he looked deep within. His name meant pure or righteous. Can you imagine a name like this for the chief financial tax gatherer of the area? Pure or righteous. Can you see what happened when Zacchaeus would go along to uh, get somebody uh, down on a deal in, in tax and, and really exercise some extra financial leverage with him when he just took, let's say that, that he went out to gather some taxes from a guy that was uh, uh, gardening and then the man didn't have the money to pay him so he decided that he would appropriate the man's lawnmower or sift, it would have been in biblical days, so the man couldn't work now you take it as means of livelihood this is the kind of guy we're talking about sort of thing he would do and can you imagine what people would say there goes pure <laughs> the sort of the thing that happened was people spewing his name out of their mouths as he went his way but incredibly about this man's action no matter how bad he is and no matter how bad we may see him as there is yet something of good within him Something wonderful, something that dreams of pureness and rightness. I'm struck with this in the Gospels. How Jesus can meet the most debased sort of a people and the people that you wouldn't think would have a flicker of interest in righteousness or God. But Jesus will look at them and he will just in a moment begin to pick out and build upon that which is right and good within them. He takes a woman who has five husbands and is living with a man who's not her husband and he brings her to a knowledge of himself. He takes a woman who is caught in the act of adultery and brings her to himself. He has this way with people of looking at, their, at, at the yearnings for good that are within him. And, and the Lord knows probably that this man, Zacchaeus, lived with this affront. He knew that his name meant pure, but all his life he'd acted another way. No matter how bad a person may be, the Lord, in looking at his life, can also see that which may be redeemed, that which is good. Keith Miller, in his book, Habitation of Dragons, quotes from an author who says this, that I think really applies to Zacchaeus. And the author is talking about the creation of man on earth. Someone has imagined God first fashioning man, and one of the hosts of heaven watching, exclaiming in alarm, but you are giving this creature freedom. He will never be wise enough or strong enough to handle it. 
he will think himself a god. He will boast in his own self-sufficiency. How can you gamble that he will ever return to you? And God replied, I have left him unfinished within. I have left in him deep needs that only I can satisfy, that out of his desire, his homesickness of soul, he will remember to turn to me. I have left him unfinished. That's how Zacchaeus is. And Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus. I don't know what's all involved in that, but given the meaning of the name of Jesus and given Zacchaeus' name, I just wonder if there might not be a connection. Jesus' name meant God saves or He saves. And Zacchaeus' name meant pure. And I wonder if Zacchaeus wanted to meet a man whose character matched what his name meant. And he had heard, evidently, about Jesus from various sources, probably at the local annual convention in Jerusalem of tax collectors in, in, in Palestine, uh, in the hotel lobby one day. They got to talking, and, he, and, he, and, and Matthew was there at the, at the tax collector's convention, and he said, uh, I'm temporarily on leave from my new job. You can't believe what happened to me. And a, and a bunch of them else, we see them in Luke chapter 15 where it indicates for us that tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. All drawing near to him. And no doubt many of those were at the same convention and saying, this man receives tax collectors and there is a newness to our life. Do you know that before we met him, we had everything, we lived in the best houses, we drove the best camels, we had the, we had the finest uh, calling cards, every servants and everything but we were empty and we thought life consisted in material things but when we met him we discovered what we needed most of all was peace within and right relationship with God and a right relationship with other people and ever since that happened has happened our lives are different our families are different everything has changed and maybe that's why Zacchaeus wanted to get through to Jesus he had heard about him from the other tax collectors that had been received Here's this man, chief tax administrator, having many people report to him, but who extends himself literally out on a branch of a tree to see the Lord. Well, Zacchaeus saw himself, no doubt, from a mixed way, a small man with big ambitions and ideas, but also a man whose name meant pure, but whose life was certainly contradictory of his name. How did the Lord see him? Well, I think the Lord saw him maybe in about three ways and perhaps more. But his first gaze at Zacchaeus certainly indicated to the Lord that here was a person who wanted to get close to him. He wanted to get close in to Jesus. The other day as I was preparing this sermon, I was in my office and I thought, hmm, I wonder what it would be like to be walking down a street in the midst of a crowd and to see a man in, a, in, a, in Hart Shafter and Mark's robes up in a tree waiting for me to come down the street, what it, what it would look like. And you've got to remember that, that Zacchaeus is seen here in a sycamore tree. Now, a sycamore tree was evidently a, a tree that had uh, fruit that looked like figs that was eaten by the poor people. And it had leaves that were like mulberry leaves. It had a short trunk and wide lateral branches, so it was easy to climb. And so I looked out the window and I saw a tree across the street with a branch that was hanging out over the road. So I had to get out, walk down the street and look at that branch from all sides to kind of get a fix. And what I discovered is that probably Jesus wasn't a mile away from him when he talked to him, but he was right up probably very close. And just as he's about to go by that branch, he looks up and there is Zacchaeus. And the Lord immediately sees that if anyone who's dressed that well has gone to that kind of trouble to see him, he must really want to get close. There must be something motivating him. One writer of another century great to see some of these old divines as they're called in their rich devotional writings says this about Zacchaeus Zacchaeus in the sycamore tree was as ripe fruit which dropped into the Savior's lap at his first and lightest touch <laughs> now the great thing about the Lord is that when he looked at Zacchaeus he saw the true intention on Zacchaeus' heart that Zacchaeus indeed wanted to get close the Lord didn't type him as other people had typed him it's so easy to get locked into what what others' views of you are like. Remember as a teenager, you have some students get in the mold of, well, they're a student, and others get in the mold of, well, they're just fun-loving, and others get in the mold of, they're real sharp, and others in the mold of, they're real dull, and there are a lot of molds that I won't even mention. But type. And Jesus refuses to type anyone by either what he thought of himself or what others have thought of him. He's willing to start fresh. 
He's going to start just as fresh with us. And the Lord knows his name. I don't know how the Lord knew his name. Some said, have suggested that the Lord, through divine omniscience, like he met when he met with Nathaniel in John chapter 1, knew his name in advance. Others have said that the Lord, when he was passing through, asked one of his disciples, who was that up there? And Matthew said, I met him at the tax convention last year. His <laughs> name is Zacchaeus. I don't know. But Jesus called him by his name. He knows our name. The Lord saw him as someone who wanted to get close. The Lord, secondly, saw him as someone who would enjoy his company. So he says to him, Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm going to stay at your house today. It's the only time in the Gospels where Jesus ever invited himself anywhere. All of the other occasions, we just either find Jesus there or find out that someone had asked him. But this time, he says to a man, I want to be a guest in your house. And Zacchaeus' response indicates that the Lord read truly, for Zacchaeus made haste and received him joyfully. I like that response which he has to the Lord. I like his response because it seems to me it's the way we always ought to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to come willingly and joyfully. The Lord resisted certain techniques in drawing Zacchaeus to himself. He did not try to arm twist Zacchaeus. Say, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come to your house and I'm not sure whether you want me to come, so I'm going to give you 30 seconds. And when you're through, then that's it. Zacchaeus, I'm not coming. But he said, Zacchaeus, I sense you want to come. Come on, let's go. There was no psychological technique that the Lord used on him to try to induce him in some sort of a, a guilt feeling. In fact, the Lord when he witnessed to a person for the first time, never once in the Gospels used the fear tactic on an individual. It was always the joy and the love. You'll find in the Gospels where Jesus uses fear, it is in reference to those who over a period of time have continually hardened himself, themselves to him, and no other resort is left but Jesus to say, now if you go on doing this, then this is what's going to happen. But the first approach was winsome and full of love and joy. And he says to Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house. Now, when we come to Jesus Christ, it ought to be because we want to come. If you come to the Lord Jesus Christ because someone else wants you to come, but you don't want to come, you're going to have a miserable time of it. You're never going to be quite sure whether you're really in or you're out. If someone forces you to come or pressures you to come, then all of your life as a Christian, you're going to have that tendency to want to walk out the same door you came in. Jesus is looking for persons who want him and who would enjoy his company. So, the Lord says, I'm going to your house. I receive you unconditionally, just as you are. I don't know what your house looks like. If it's a hovel, I'm willing to go there, but I suspect by looking at you that it's something else. I'll go there. Now, the Lord didn't even evidently make him clean up his house before he came. He didn't say, Zacchaeus, before I come to your house, I want to know if you are paying your employees right. And you better get that straight before I come. He didn't say to him, Zacchaeus, before I come to your house, I want to know what art you have on the wall. He didn't say to him, Zacchaeus, I don't know what kind of family situation you have and if people in your household look appropriately for me to come to your house or not, but I want you to get them in order before I come. Striking. I've known all my life this little poem which goes, if Jesus came to your house, what would you do? And I don't remember all the limericks to it, but it talks about you'd put away this and you'd put away that and you'd put away this. And I sometimes wonder when I go through this poem, what in the world do we as Christians live like? We have to put away all that stuff. And there maybe it's a a helpful thing to remind us that uh, as Christians we should keep our homes up for the Lord to come into it. But here is a man who the Lord doesn't say anything about what your house looks like. How come just as it is? Sometimes wonder if Zacchaeus had a wife, what she felt like when all of a sudden the Lord with his retinue shows up. Fortunately, they probably had servants to help out. But there's the Lord coming. He sees Zacchaeus as someone who would enjoy his company. And then the Lord also sees Zacchaeus as the story progresses. He sees Zacchaeus as someone who not only wants to get close and not only wants to receive him joyfully, but he sees Zacchaeus finally as someone who will make it right with others, the wrongs which he has done. The first effect of getting right with God is getting right with other people. (laughs) That's the next thing that happens. 
When you become right with the Lord, the hurts and the bitternesses you felt toward others in your family or people at work or whatever, all of a sudden, as you yield to the Lord, these go. And one is cleaned up all the way, this way and this way. And Zacchaeus said, I've got to get right. You see, they were bringing a charge against Jesus that he eats with sinners. And it says in verse 7, they all murmured. I sometimes wonder who that all was. I think that the twelve were just a little bit upset. The Lord's got big things. He needs to get in Jerusalem. We've got a cult waiting. No, he, they didn't know that yet. They, uh, they wanted to get on the way. And now the Lord is delaying. And they all murmured. We should be taking time with this person. And the crowds, and of course the religious leaders were always upset with Jesus. So, he goes in. And uh, all of this is being said that he eats with sinners. And Zacchaeus maybe got the wind of some of this. And he thought, well, I've got to make, I've got to defend the Lord. And it's right. I am the kind of a person they say. I am. I am a sinner. And, and I'm going to be different from now on. So he stands up and he says to the Lord. He does two things that are really incredible. First of all, an act of charity. He says, half of everything which I have, I give to the poor. Now, by the way, that uh, should set your mind at ease in case, you, you know, the Lord didn't necessarily call everybody to do this. He, he did call in Luke 18 a rich young ruler to do this, and the guy didn't, and he went away sorrowful. It's fun to see in Luke 19 that the guy who did do what Jesus told him to do was joyful. One guy went away sad, and he had money. The other guy didn't, gave it all away, and he was happy. So, that's that. But Zacchaeus, gets up and he says, half I give to the poor. And then he says, if I've defrauded anyone, and actually the, the, the reading beneath that is, um, the, the tenses reflect that Zacchaeus is not saying if I defraud anybody, but those whom I have defrauded. He recognizes he has indeed conned quite a few people. I will restore to them fourfold. Zacchaeus evidently all these years that nobody thought he had a religious interest knew some of the Bible. <laughs> because what he pulls out at this moment is something which reflects that he has a knowledge of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there were two kinds of restorations. One type of restoration was where if a person on his own confessed that he had wronged someone financially, he then was required to restore what he had taken plus 20%. Good rate of interest payback. But if he had robbed someone and was discovered. Let's say he took somebody's lamb. Exodus chapter 22 talks about this situation. And 2 Samuel chapter 12 talks about it as well. He took somebody's lamb, and they caught him after he killed the lamb. Then he was responsible for restoring to the person from whom he had stolen four sheep. Restore fourfold. What does Zacchaeus do on this occasion? Under the Old Testament law, he could have said, I give to those whom I have defrauded all that I have defrauded plus 20%. He would have been correct. But instead he says, forget the law, I'm going to go beyond its limits. If I have defrauded anyone, I'm going to restore to them not simply 20%, but I'm going to give them 400%. Now you say, how in the world could he make so much money that half of it he could give away to the poor and half he could repay fourfold? He evidently was a shrewd investor with all the cheating that he'd done, so he wound up with enough to give it all away. And what an incredible thing this is. Here is a man who now is willing, because of his association with the Lord, to make a clean break with the past. And that's part of discipleship. Zacchaeus just couldn't go on in that town being chief tax collector and behaving like he was. Now, he maybe could go on being chief tax collector, although it would be probable that he wouldn't stay in office too long because he wouldn't have come up with Rome's quotas. But he couldn't have gone on cheating people like he did. You see, if he had gone on and said, I believe in Jesus, and then kept on cheating people, he would have been no longer pure Zacchaeus. His, his, his work would have betrayed his word. So that clean break is needed. And Christ, the same way, calls us that when we come to him to make a clean break with that which is wrong. Now, there's something about this by way of conclusion. That verses 9 and 10 tell us, in conclusion, something about the man and something about the son of man. About the man, they tell us that as a result of his desire to come close, enjoy the Lord's company, and in addition, get right with others, the Lord said, 
salvation has come to this man's house. And he also is a son of Abraham. Son of Abraham, Jesus continually told his religious opposition, was not a title that was bestowed upon a person simply because of his genetic connection. The title son of Abraham was bestowed because one had a faith that was like Abraham's. He trusted in God. So Jesus is saying to this man, you are a son of Abraham and you are fully received in God's sight. Zacchaeus could look back and he could say, thank God I interrupted my schedule today and came to the Lord and salvation now is in my house and the things I've always lacked inside of me are now met by Jesus. And I got to thinking of that, by the way. Zacchaeus must have put off quite a few appointments that day to wait in the throng to see Jesus. Must have been probably the busy administrator that he was. It, it meant something for him to take off. And uh, there's also something else, though, that we see as we look at the close of the story. Something great happens to the man he saves, but there's also something which is said about the Son of Man and explains why Jesus found Zacchaeus in the first place. Jesus says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, lost in the New Testament can mean one of two things. Lost can mean a person who is eternally lost, or lost can mean a person who is in the wrong place. And of course, ultimately, it can mean, and always will mean, if a person is without Christ, eternally lost. But so often a person is simply in the wrong place. God never meant him to be in that place in his life. Zacchaeus was in a spiritually lost condition because he hadn't found himself and he hadn't found the Lord. I can remember as a kid being lost in a store. Any of you remember when you were kids and you were lost? Other people knew where I was, but I thought I was lost. And all the, other world was, all the rest of the world that was looking at me was a stranger. I remember the sheer panic. I wasn't lost because I was not in existence. I was lost because I was in the wrong place and somebody had to find me. And Jesus has caught this man Zacchaeus in the wrong place. And he said, I've come to find him and put him in the right place. And I've come to seek the lost. That explains why Jesus saw Zacchaeus. You see, all along Jesus had been looking for people like Zacchaeus. Someone has said, if you, if you aim for nothing, you will miss it every time. And Jesus did not conduct his ministry without purposes. He had purposes. His fundamental purpose was to seek persons who were in the wrong place and help them find the right place for their lives. And so when he was going through that throng that day outside of Jericho, he was looking at faces. And what was he looking at faces for? He was looking at people whose faith registered that they had need, that they wanted him. And he kept looking. And as he walked down the street, he was busy in his mind picking out the most intensely wanting person he could find. He was seeking the lost. And when he spotted Zacchaeus, their eyes locked. And he said, that's the man. It's because he had a purpose that he found Zacchaeus. He sought the lost, but he saved the man who was lost. The Son of Man is come to save. I mentioned last Sunday evening at the close of Gloria Rose concert that I have really begun this kind of a confession this late in life and having preached on this many times, but I am seeing more and more the power of the phrase, born again. I've heard it so often in my life that it, for me, for a long period of time, it was trite. Born again. I almost quit using it. It just seemed like it was used so much. And it became kind of a, a doctrinal thing that you say, yes, I believe in bo being born again. I am born again. But you really don't understand or appreciate the magnitude of what is involved in really being born again. It means starting life all over. Starting it with God, going the right way. And I've seen that the greatest need that a person has who is in the wrong place is not some more directions, not some more commandments, not some more money, but a whole new life, a new way, a clean slate of being born again. That's what it is to be saved. Jesus came to bring salvation. And you watch this man, Zacchaeus. His slate is clean. He is a new man. And Jesus has come to us as individuals. And never forget that we can be in a crowd like we are right now. But he hasn't lost track of any one of us in this room. And he says, if I can see a person who wants to come to me, who will be happy that I'm in their life, 
and who will stand out for me, I'll come and their life will be new. And I will give them joy. The gospel means literally the good news. Jesus says, I'm a friend of sinners. And he says to us again today, I'm your friend. Lord, we thank you for the newness which you bring. For the changes which you bring. We thank you for the privilege of gathering in your presence and the opportunity in our own lives to be born again. Lord, sometimes when we look at ourselves, we hate, particularly before we came to you, when we looked at our lives, we didn't like what we saw. Now, Lord, we're beginning to like the things which you're doing now that we're yours. Still see some things we don't like, but you're working on that. And we're giving them to you. And Lord, before we came to you, we might have been a person like Zacchaeus that others couldn't stand. We might have even been a popular person. But the important thing is, Lord, in this story and for us, is that we see that it's more important how you look at us than how we look at ourselves or how others see us. For if we can, just for a moment, understand what you think of us, it changes what we think of ourselves and ultimately will change even what others think of us. That you've come into life to give us a marvelous freedom, to set us free from the old gods, to set us free from the trappings of externalities which only constrict us and bind us and put us on the road to death. And you've come instead, Lord, to set us free in spirit, free and new and right inside. And we praise you for this. Lord, while we're just here in prayer, I want to give an opportunity to anyone who is kindred spirit to Zacchaeus today who would say, Lord, come into my life to do that. And while we're just waiting before the Lord in prayer, if it would be your desire today to just say, Lord, come into my life, would you just slip up your hand where you're at as an indication to the Lord, Lord, here I am. Come into my life. I'm looking for you today. Could I just see your hand? Thank you. The Lord bless. Others would raise their hand as an indication that today, today salvation has come to you. Wonderful. Thank God for his work of grace and for this particularly one man who has responded, yes, today I want to see Jesus. Could I just ask my friend, and nobody knows at this point who he may be, to just now as we continue in prayer, open your life and invite the Lord into your heart. And we'll just wait before the Lord in a moment of prayer and worship.